Hi. I'm Kate O'Donnell, and tonight I'm going to be telling you my favorite example, my favorite example from history of what can be revealed from the insatiable and awesome curiosity of just the average person. So this is a story about ancient history, which is why to begin we need to go all the way back to 1992 in Xi'an, Beikun, China, which is in eastern China's uh, Zhejiang province. And it's a small rural farming area along with the surrounding Longyu County. It's along the banks of the Chu River, very peaceful, and the village sits at the bottom of a large hill known as Phoenix Mountain, slightly ambitiously named mountain, but it's known as Phoenix Mountain. And on the mountain are an assortment of ponds, or were, many of them rectangular. As you can see in this photo from a science paper, science! spoiler, the ponds are interesting. I know, unknown, yes. So they were known as bottomless ponds, which was a name and legend that went back further than anyone could remember and was very well deserved. So these ponds were so deep that they provided the entire village's water supply. And people had tested them over the years with putting down long sticks of bamboo to try to find the bottom and in none of them were people ever able to measure the depth and get to the bottom of the pond. Now, some of these ponds had fish, some did not. And one year, in 1992, uh, someone caught a very big fish from one of these ponds. This is scientifically accurate. Um, science. Accuracy. So, no, this fish was over 30 pounds from a tiny one of these little ponds. It had clearly had time to grow old and very large in the deep. Now, if there had been curiosity about these ponds beforehand, oh my God. Uh, you know, I mean, who knew what treasures of fish lay down below? This guy decided to find out. Now, he has al was already very curious about these ponds. He had sort of led the initiative with a bamboo stick depth trying on numerous occasions. And so he was f determined to figure this out. But how do you get to the bottom of a bottomless pond? I know, I had to say it once. <laughs> you drain it! <laughs> I know, it's way too soon. It's way too soon. It's way too soon. We're going back to the picture of Wu. Yeah. So basically, so no, like as you do when you're faced with a bottomless pond, Wu went and found three other villagers and uh, basically convinced them all to go in together on a water pump so they could drain one of these motherfuckers. As you do, for science. So, wonder science. So, on June 9th, 1992, they began pumping and pumping and pumping 24, I know this, 24 hours a day. And after about five days of 24 hour well, nonstop water pumping, the level of water has gone down a little. And lo and behold, what is revealed, this is one of my favorite parts, it's so cool. Okay, it's not more fish, it's not ships, it's not Cthulhu. I know, you know, I can, we can just end this. Um, it's a set of stone stairs that are descending, yeah, that are descending down into the deep. I know. So, okay, so at this point, they stop and are like, hold up, Let, we need to talk. And they have some discussion. Um, and basically what they decide to do is get four more water pumps. <laughs> They quadruple down, and they pump, and pump. And after 17 days of nonstop pumping, they finally drain this bottomless pond. Guess what it is? <laughs> okay, so what had looked like just a rectangular pond was actually a skylight and rooftop entrance to a massive man-made cave. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> 
And it was, this, it was this spectacular display of master craftsmanship. There are these perfectly parallel lines that are chiseled into the floors and the walls and the pillars and the ceilings. It's decorated in detail. It's huge. Yeah, I know. Uh, there are artistic carvings in the pillars and on the walls. And there's even a drainage system to catch any water seeps that are coming in from above. It's amazing. No other fish, though, so, you know, it's kind of a bummer. But, okay, the cave, if they find out, dates to 230 BCE, more than 2,000 years ago, yeah, and it looks good as new. So, Wu was the first person to enter the cave, which I just is, like, the most King Tut tomb reveal moment that I can imagine, and it only gets better. Okay, so remember how I just said how Phoenix Mountain had a lot of rectangular ponds all over it? Oh yeah, there are more caves. Turns out there is a total of 24 caves carved underneath this hill. None of them are connected together. And not all of them aged the same. Um, there are actually 14 that have the roofs collapsed in, but there are 10 that are basically in perfect condition, and all of them are this amazing example of master craftsmanship and engineering. The ceilings are all at perfect 45 degree angles, the floors are all perfectly flat and level, and when you pair the caves together, it just becomes very impressive. I mean, that they're at equal levels, the precision of the cave's engineering is impressive and really raises even more questions about how these were built. In some cases, they're as close as 50 centimeters apart, which when you think about how people would be carving caves with no way of communicating with each other, and the walls are perfectly straight, I mean, it's, it's very impressive. Also, so the skylight slash entrances allow some sun to come inside, but the majority of the caves are very dark and require artificial lighting, which means that if one was carving them, one would assumedly be working by torchlight. However, if one was working by torchlight, there would be some residue of smoke on the walls or on the ceilings, and there is none. So a few steel chisels were found um, in one of the caves, and basically that is the only thing that we have to indicate at all how these were made because the rest is pretty much unknown as is where all that rock went that's a lot of it because the caves are huge the average floor area of each cave is 11,000 square feet with heights up to 10 stories tall put together the caves would cover three and a half square city blocks so Okay, there are a lot of mysteries here, and I'm just going to say, if you're looking for answers, you came to Odd Salon Unknown, so this is not the talk for you. <laughs> Basically, though, if you want an answer, like, hold on to this next moment, because it's literally the only one there is about this entire thing. Basically, so for the engineers, one of the really big questions for them is how it's possible that these were able to stay standing. Because the stone they're made of is sandstone, which is reasonably durable, but not durable, like durable in a let's like make, you know, an English manor, not durable like let's have a man-made carved cave stand for over 2,000 years. And so it was this big mystery to be solved, and engineers did a lot of study on it and basically found that the ones that survived did so because they were filled with water. And while each of the pillars can uh, support basically over half a million pounds, it was the water that was also helping support that roof that made each of these ones that are very well preserved, so well preserved and so still structurally sound. That said, now that they've been drained, they're actually having to be able to start putting in some additional supports. But, I mean, obviously it's a lot easier to work in there now than it was before. How were they made is a very big question mark still. Basically, scientists calculate that it would have taken a thousand people working 24 hours a day at least six years just to excavate all of the stone. Now, that does not account for all of the additional time that would have been needed to have all of this beautiful precision chiseling and decoration. This is basically a massive construction project of a scale pretty much achieved only by emperors. 
which is what makes this next part so crazy. All right, so I mentioned the King Tut tomb reveal. Um, unlike King Tut's tomb, no one had ever looked for these because the caves were unknown to history. <laughs> okay, no, but seriously, like as you think about that, a couple things. Chinese have a, like, China has a very long history of very meticulous record keeping. And well, yes, you know, a number of records were destroyed during different dynasties. We have a number of very lengthy texts with very detailed history about the time that these caves are believed to be from, as well as the specific region. After they were discovered, people, scholars, went back to try to scour the texts and find any mention of these that we just missed. And there is literally not a single mention of the construction of these caves anywhere. I know. No, so, I mean, there are a couple mentions that give clues to the existence of the caves. Basically, the biggest one is a mention of an inscription on a temple that says that there were people who carved stone into a room and took a king. And the descendants of the specific people mentioned did live in that area, so this does seem like a very reasonable, uh, you know, mention of these Longyu caves, but they don't say anything more than that. That one singular reference doesn't tell us anything about why or how or for, you know, for what they were made. So that's the other thing that's unknown to history is what the hell these caves were for. The first scientists to hear about them thought that they were quarries. And, you know, quarries, like, oh, we discovered some quarries. It's not quite as exciting. So actually, the discovery of these didn't really get known for another six years when some other scientists heard about it and came on by and were like, mm, about that quarry idea. So in defense of the quarry theory, the caves are along a river. And, you know, the stone was definitely shipped down that river because there's no evidence locally of what happened to all of that stone. And if it was a quarry, it wouldn't really, you know, the building of it wouldn't necessarily be worth mentioning in the history books, would make sense. But if quarrying sandstone was the idea, why make literally the most impractical quarry ever? Where instead of looking like this, where you can just go in and get rock, it's more of a carry that rock up through a small staircase through a tiny hole in the roof kind of situation. Also, there's the matter of decoration, and the scientists who are still in the it's a quarry camp, I mean, admit that definitely, okay, maybe it started as a quarry, but it was used for something else later, but they have no idea what that would be. Science. Science. So another theory put forward is that the caves were storage areas, so perhaps storage for grain. Um, and maybe, again, not necessarily interesting enough to go down in the history books, but many consider this theory unlikely because why go to so much trouble for a storage area for things underground, especially food, which, you know, when held in a cave isn't necessarily the best place to put it when it keeps, comes to, you know, keeping them good long term. Okay, another theory. The general time period the caves are believed to be from is during the Warring States period. So there were a lot of battles going on, and there are some scholars who believe that the caves were sort of a secret staging ground for military and military supplies. But if the caves, you know, I mean, if the caves were an emperor's secret project, again, that would make sense why it was deleted from the history books. But um, there are others who disagree with this, noting that such a massive scale project doesn't really fit with the whole idea of like a covert, you know, covert military operation. It would have been anything but covert. So, others believe that the caves may have been a palace, but if they were intended as living quarters, then why weren't there any sort of, sort of infrastructure rooms inside, and why were they empty? That last point, why were they empty, goes against another theory that the caves were designed to be a mausoleum. Because, okay, even if your like, chosen mausoleum decor scheme isn't 8,000 terracotta warrior chic, like, by definition, you put something in a mausoleum. And aside from a few pieces of pottery and those uh, steel chisels that we saw a moment ago, there was nothing. So basically, the long and short of it is there is no scientific consensus to what these caves were made for. I mean, of course, there's an internet consensus. <laughs> but, but, okay, my favorite part 
about the Long New Cave alien conspiracy theorists is that even they debunk their own theory because they're like, wait, these were man-made, carved by hand. Aliens have technology. Why would they spend so much time carving these by hand? And if it was because it was like an artisanally crafted gift to Earth, <laughs> like, why would they then not tell us about them? So basically, like, even the people who have an answer to everything are puzzled. And I mean, that's kind of the amazing thing about the Long New Caves is that, you know, the like who, what, where, when, how, why is just one big question mark. I mean, okay, we've got the where, but do we? So this and this, they, these aren't the Long New Caves, but they are man-made and they're ancient and they're covered in similar decorative pattern, line chisel marks. These are the Huashan Caves, which are basically the same distance from the Long Yu Caves as we are right now from Monterey. Um, well, they have a arguably better modern lighting scheme than the Long Yu Caves. <laughs> like the other similarities are very sort of unnervingly similar. They were also carved into a hill. They were also accidentally discovered by a farmer this time in 2000. There are 36 of them. And in terms of what they were, like rewind a couple minutes for all those hypotheses and the reasons why those hypotheses are doubted, same thing. So, I mean, there's something really magical about this story that I love and that, you know, the, like the unknown factor is just so pervasive. It's unknown to history. It's unknown to scientific consensus. Frankly, I mean, it's unknown to most Americans. Like, unless I've talked your ear about this, off about this already, or you are a visitor of alien conspiracy sites, I'm gonna guess you probably haven't heard of these before. I hadn't until a couple months ago when I was doing research for an art project and when I was doing research about them for this talk, I had to hire a translator because like 99% of the information out there is in Chinese, um, including a very amusing report that a journalist did in 1999 when the Chinese Ministry of Culture and Tourism and scientists held this big summit at the Long Yu Caves. And basically what the reporter said is like, he kind of doubted the Chinese Ministry of Culture and Tourism's commitment to sparkle motion when it came to <laughs> figuring this out. And like to paraphrase, he's like, well, I'm not saying they're not working on it. It's the appeal of the unknown that's driving the tourism. And like, I mean, they're not wrong. <laughs> it's definitely why it was, you know, I mean, it's been added like to my bucket list. It's, you know, it's the allure, right? There is this really amazing thing about the curiosity of the unknown that we have no idea. And I mean, that's what discovered them in the first place. Like I, that is my favorite part about the story that it was one dude's curiosity about a pond that led to basically the discovery of what one could argue is like one of the wonders of the world. So tonight I would like to raise a glass to Wu. May all of our own insatiable curiosities lead us to discovering such majesty.